Morning everyone. Um, my name's Min. I'm a sexual health specialist. I work in private practice in Auckland and I'm also on the after hours uh, roster for the sexual assault um, uh, call outs for the police. And I also do a colposcopy clinic at County's Manukau. Um, the session this morning is on urgent gynecology. So it's a women's health day. So I've left all the male sexual health out, out of my talk today. And it's, it's 20 minutes long, so um, there's not a, not, a lot, not a lot of detail that I can go into around, um, around sexual health. With regards to the urgent, the urgent bit, um, I had a bit of a think about this because when it comes to sexual health, there's urgent and then there's urgent. And there are acute presentations, but sometimes the patients might think the world has ended or they're really dying, but really they're not. Uh, so there's urgent and then there's urgent. So what I thought I would divide my talk into is what we regard as the acute presentations, what you should, what should be urgent, uh, but we tend to miss the diagnosis and the not so urgent. In other words, the patients think it's urgent, but actually you've got time. So with regards to the acute presentations, these are the ones that I thought uh, should, should be dealt with on the day. So ulcers, uh, genital herpes, the pain, and that can be the vulval pain or the pelvic pain. And then there's your odd presentations for uh, sexual assault, which you need to know what to do at the time. The should be urgents are the cancers and then the syphilis. And then the not so urgents are these, the Friday afternoon, the I've got an STD, the skin problems, the discharge, and then the unexpected positive results, which, which can cause a lot of issues at the time, but really you've got time to sort it out. So way to get help. The sexual health guidelines are online, nzshs.org guidelines. Those are very good guidelines, which were based originally on the county's Manukau sexual health guidelines. You can find that on the net. There's also the health pathways, which should give you quite a lot of uh, guidance and help around uh, what to do with treatment and management. If you need to ring someone, best person to call is just pick up the phone and ring the call center at ADHB. Ring the registrar, ask them any stupid question that you want and they will be able to, to help walk you through, through that. So just to remind you that public sexual health service is only delivered through Auckland District Health Board. Counties Manukau does not have a sexual health uh, department, so any help that you need goes through the uh, ADHB. And then with private, there's, uh, there's two of us, uh, myself and Dr. Nikki Perkins. We're the only two private specialists in the whole country, and we work in, uh, in Riviera in, in Auckland. So if you want to refer patients privately, then, then um, uh, the website is on there as well. The Auckland Sexual Health Service went through quite a lot of restructure uh, this year, which means that access for patients is now a lot harder than it used to be. You can't self-refer unless you are high risk. So the, they're not, they have really culled the ability for public to self-refer to, uh, to the service. Uh, it's now mainly um, tertiary, secondary referral and tertiary service. If you're brown, young, or any of the below, then you can self-refer, right, or walk in. Otherwise, as GPs, you can refer any of these. The syphilis, HIV, difficult problems, uh, all uh, MSM-related issues, so that's men who have sex with men, skin, pain, ulcers, and then the chronic or difficult discharge, urethritis, BV, candidiasis, they will take as referrals. What they will not see is the chronic stuff, the chronic pelvic pain, uh, immigrations, abnormal bleeding, contraception, terminations, sexual dysfunction, and the simple stuff which you've already diagnosed and then they expect that the GP should be able to manage themselves. Any problems, you can just ring through the service and they can walk you through it. So I'm just gonna move on to uh, genital herpes. 
Velocyclovir is now first line and takes over from acyclovir, so the special authority for that has now been removed and is completely funded. Comes in two sizes, 500 and the one gram tablet. For your first episode, it's a one gram BD for seven days and episodic treatment, 500 BD for three days. And if you're gonna put someone on suppression, uh, it's 500 once a day for as long as the patient wants, really. The advantage of alacyclovir is that, uh, it's the, for, especially for suppressive treatment, it's a once a day dose. Acyclovir used to be twice a day, which uh, was a bit more difficult for patients to, to comply with. With the swabs, just remember that uh, with herpes swabs, the sooner you get the swab done, the better. That, of course, depends on when the patient presents, but you just have to remember that if patients turn out three or four days down the track, your pickup rate for, the, the, uh, for getting a swab done is, is going to drop off quite remarkably. So don't, don't depend too much on getting a positive swab back in order to confirm the result. Uh, having said that, always take a swab. So never rely on clinical diagnosis for confirmation of, of herpes. We, we see a lot of people who say, I saw my GP and they had, they had a look and they said I had herpes and no test was, was ever done. So these days, you must always do a swab, even if you don't think you're going to get a positive result back. Because if it does come back positive, that is so helpful. It's documented in their notes. It's there forever and it can be referred back when they come, when they represent some years down the track, there is that documentation in their records. Otherwise, you've only got the patient say so for it. And even if the diagnosis is perfectly obvious, you must always do a swab. Then it also, the other thing you get is the, uh, the typing of whether it's type one or, or type two. All right. Uh, they're all done by PCR now, so the cultures have all gone out the, gone, gone out the window. So you will get, uh, and PCR is much better than culture. Pain relief, very, very important, the self-cares. So people need a lot of whole person care around acute presentations for, uh, for herpes. Now I've got, hair, I've got hair dryer and bucket on here and I'll explain what I mean. So, so going to the toilet is very painful, right? And it's a bit like after you've had a baby. It's, it's all very pretty sore and awful down there. So weeing into a bucket of water is very helpful. So you fill up a bucket or whatever is big enough that you can fit your bottom into. Uh, cat litter trays are quite good. Uh, and you, if, you, if you wee into the water, it, it takes all that urine off the, off the skin. So that's what the bucket thing is about. And then drying with a hair dryer that's set onto room temperature uh, is, is also a good, easy, and much, you know, so little tips like that are very good for the patient. Giving them time off work. The written information resources are very, very important. Uh, you must always organize referral or follow-up. If you can't manage follow-up yourself, you must refer the patient because that ongoing care is what gets them off first base and onward with their, with their journey through uh, coming to terms with the diagnosis. So never leave a herpes patient away into the abyss without some kind of, uh, kind of follow-up. Avoid the information overload. They are always going to ask you a million questions, but what you need to do is say, look, can we just get you through the first couple of days, get you more comfortable, and then when I see you again, we can go through all your questions. That is very, very important because it's like any other serious diagnosis. They start asking you, well, why have I got it, what am I going to do, and blah, blah, blah. They're not actually going to take on board anything that, you have, uh, that you're going to say to them. And of course, uh, with the acute problems, look out for the neurological complications and urinary retention, and that's the ones that will require uh, referral or uh, admission to hospital. The HSV website is an excellent resource for patients, so if you need to give them some way to go to or stuff to read, then this is the one to, to use. If you go on this website, you can order all the booklets. They've got five or six different versions of information that patients can take home and uh, have a look through. So a very, very good resource. There's also a telephone service that patients can phone. There's an email service that patients can use as well. So it's a very, very good uh, backstop for you. Your average HSV kind of looks like this. So multiple, small, shallow, uh, and quite painful, wee little ulcers, and the surrounding skin is, is red. So that's, that's classic uh, HSV little blisters. This, on the other hand, is not HSV. So 
there's ulcers, and then there's ulcers. So, so I've gone through the HSV, so now, I'm now moving on to other ulcers. It's a good start to the morning, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, so big, ugly ulcers. Um, if you have something like this, it is not herpes. Herpes are small, and they're punctate and, and uh, shallow. Something horrible like this, which is, which is large, necrotic, ragged, uh, really ugly is, is going to be something else. And in, in our population distribution, uh, and if you've got a young patient who is under the age of about 25, the most likely diagnosis here is going to be vulval apathy uh, or Epstein-Barr virus-related ulcer. Okay, so quite rare, but not that rare. And you know, you may come across these at some at some point. So you do ha it requires a bit of work up to exclude all other all the other causes, but the most likely cause is going to be uh, aphthous ulcer, which means that there's no no cause is not infectious. Uh, it gets treated with uh, prednisone and steroid, uh, and it, 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 amazingly it will heal up by itself. Very 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 painful. So just to show you the difference between different kinds of of ulcers. Pelvic inflammatory disease, uh, go through the um, guidelines to get the management for this. The antibiotic treatment for PID hasn't changed. We're still using triple, triple therapy, which is keftriaxone, doxy, and metronidazole. Before you get to the treatment, though, the diagnosis of PID is very, very difficult. And if you, if most of you will know what the diagnosis for PID requires, which is not just the sexual history, but also this business of um, pelvic tenderness and agnextal tenderness and cervical excitation and that kind of thing. Personally, I find that sort of thing completely useless because who doesn't have pain if you stick their f your fingers into their vagina and start moving them around, right? <laughs> so trying to get a diagnosis of pelvic pain and then making a diagnosis of PID based on your clinical decision is hopeless. And it is much more reliable if you use a good sexual history and your own intuition to, to, you know, to get a feeling for whether this person's got PID or not. And then the out outpatient treatment is, is that. Uh, inpatient referral is, is easy. It's uh, you know, acute, acute abdomen and fever and unwellness and that kind of thing. Uh, and then with partner no notification, male partners should, should be notified and treated uh, for with uh, uh, azithromycin. So, so that's, that's PID. The sexual assault, lots of different scenarios for this. And it's not, the sexual assault is not just what we always think about sexual assault, which is the getting dragged behind the bushes by a stranger. These days, more often, it's going to be the domestics, the parties, the alcohol, and the people who actually have no idea what's going on. So much more of that kind of, of scenarios, very, very varied. So you should have some kind of idea about what to do if people don't want to go to the police, because that's more difficult. They do want to go to the police, it's very straightforward. You just organize that and send them on their way. So if they don't want the police, or they simply have no idea what they want, then you're left with uh, what to do with the patient, and you've got a busy clinic that you need to, to get on with. Uh, and then there's all these other things you have to make a decision about. Do you examine the patient? Do you take some swabs? What do you do with treatment? Uh, what if they've got bleeding or pain? And then, then there's the um, forensic side issues around toxicology and preserving forensic evidence. So it can get quite, it can wreck your day. <laughs> So if somebody like this turns out, it will, it will wreck your day, honestly. So, so the, the Auckland Health Pathways should have a pathway that tells you what to do. Your clinic should have a policy or procedure around what to do. So because these events are very uncommon, it is, it is very useful if you have some kind of basic pathway or procedure in your clinic. So at least you have phone number about who to ring and what care to provide if people don't want to go to the police. Okay, all right. So that's all I'm going to say about it. There should be urgent. Uh, can you all spot there should be urgent on this photo? So here's a lady with long-standing lichen sclerosis. Can you all see that? Okay. So down on your 
on your right, five o'clock, there is an abnormal area that looks a bit cobblestoned and a bit lumpy. That's the should be urgent area. Okay, so you need to look and recognize these spots and that requires an urgent biopsy. Okay. Same for this, right? So this is also a should be urgent. Uh, that, is a, that can be a high grade VIN, it can be Paget. Uh, so, so things that look abnormal like this should not be passed off as a dermatitis or whatever, uh, requires urgent biopsy. And that, that was a high grade VIN. Syphilis is also a should be urgent. I haven't said too much about this because there's a lot you can say about syphilis, but it's just something that you just need to have on your radar all of the time because it is very common now, more common in males uh, than, than females, but it is in the heterosexual population. At some point, it is also going to move into the antenatal population because heterosexual men do get syphilis. So have it on your radar and be on the lookout for it. The not so urgents are divided into two groups. There's this one, which is clinically is not that urgent, but the patient is highly strung, right? So there's the two groups. There's the I've got an STD, I need some help now. And then there's the, the ladies who, have, uh, who are presenting acutely with the itching, the discharge, the discomfort, they can't walk, they can't sit, uh, they can't stand it, all right? It's probably been going on for a while, but they've turned out because they want some help today. If you need to do something and it's evolved of vaginal vulvitis or inflammation or that kind of thing, then I guess common things being common, candidiasis is going to be most likely the most common thing. So it's quite useful to start with that first. Um, always examine the patient. Now, a few things, a few handy tips to just keep in mind is that very often the patients will have already gone and got OTC cream and tablets and this kind of thing. Anybody who's had got cream on board, already had some fluconazole from the chemist, is going to have a negative culture, all right? So don't expect the swabs to come back positive. The community labs are also not that good at uh, culturing candida, so your pickup rate for candida is not going to be great, but you should always examine the patient and do the swab anyway, because it's helpful if the swabs do come back uh, positive. With the treatment, um, if someone's got quite severe or acute candidiasis, the, the one week or the one tablet doesn't always quite do it, and repeating it is a very helpful thing to do. And I, I have found that three doses of fluconazole is definitely more helpful than one. So if you give them three, one on do a Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday type arrangement, then it will be more helpful than just having the one stat, one stat dose. And symptoms can take a long time to settle. It's like the scabies thing where the itching goes on for a long time. Uh, they can take a while to settle with candidiasis as well. So they may expect an instant overnight cure, but it's not going to happen. So you need to tell them that. And then there's this one. They're not so urgent and you have got time to sort it out. So if you're looking at someone on a, an examination, you're not quite sure what you're looking at, right? Or if someone's got unexpected chlamydia result or something like this, then should you be treating them that day, right? So. I'll just start with the second bullet point first. If somebody comes in, you've done their STI screening, they come back with a positive chlamydia gonorrhea result, totally unexpected, long-term monogamous relationship, it's all gonna go to custard, all right? Uh, it is very, very helpful to not treat them that day and repeat the swabs, okay? What you don't wanna do is to then give them the antibiotics because what you've then done is you've given yourself no opportunity to double check or confirm the, the results. Do I, does that make sense? Okay, so repeat the swabs, or if you don't want to do that, then, then refer them into sexual health or private to, to get them uh, rechecked by, by us. Um, the other thing you can do is to, is to phone lab test and speak to Arlo, and she will dig out the swap that you did before and double check that for you as well. So do whatever you can to reconfirm results before you actually treat the patient. No one's going to die of chlamydia and gonorrhea. You can always do, you know, you can always get them back in a couple of days time when you sorted it out so that they, the patient knows whether they've got a false positive result, if it's going to be that important. All right? Okay. They're not sure what it is. This is a good example of the not sure what it is. All right. 
Can you all see that quite clearly? Are those really warts? They are beautifully symmetrical, right, on both sides. Uh, they're not craggy. Uh, they're not uh, rough. Um, if you looked at them very closely with a magnifying glass, you'll find that all the papillae go start from the bottom, go all the way up and go back down to the bottom again, and they're all kind of individual like, like fingers. And they look a bit like the sea anemones in a fish tank. Okay. So if you, if you see things like this, which are, which are on both sides and are smooth and look quite, quite regular, not warts. These are vestibular papilloma, all right? Normal variant, very, very common. So this is the Friday afternoon scenario as well. If you start cryoing this, putting on um, a Miquimod or um, other treatment for HPV, you've done two things. You've given the patient diagnosis of HPV, right, which is very impacting, that's the first thing. And the second is that um, if it causes changes to the skin, there's no way that, that a specialist can then come on afterwards to decide whether it was or wasn't HPV to start with, right? Now, if you were the patient and the GP told you you had HPV and then given you all the treatment and then you don't really know whether it was or it wasn't, uh, it's very difficult, right, to, to, to go onwards with that. So get a second opinion if you're really not sure. If you are sure, then fine, go ahead and, and manage the patient. But it can be very helpful to get one of your colleagues to come in and have a look. Or if it's that important, no one's going to die from this. <laughs> and it, it's very helpful to get a confirmed diagnosis and then everybody's on the same page. Here's a photo of uh, bad discharge, right? So a lot of inflammation, petechiae. On here, you can see the red spots and discharge that is just uh, pouring out. Differential diagnoses for these uh, candidiasis, trichomonas, group A strep, uh, vulval vaginitis, uh, foreign body, uh, and then uh, the other small print one would be DIV, which is desquamative inflammatory vaginitis. And here's the picture of the same patient. So a lot of discharge, a lot of vaginal inflammation, and all these spots, which, which we colloquially call uh, measles in the vagina, is hemorrhaging in the mucosa. And this is a classic picture that you would get with either uh, trichomonas infection or uh, desquamative inflammatory vaginitis. So ask yourself, the ask, make sure you ask the right questions with the patient, and then ask yourself, why are you doing these tests? Are these the right tests to be doing? What are you going to do with the results? Okay, so always preempt uh, the outcome of the results of swabs that you're going to be taking. Uh, what will happen if I give the patient this diagnosis and the treatment, and have I sorted out uh, follow-up? So, for example, in a very basic example is if you're going to do an HIV test, consider what's going to happen if that test comes back positive. Or if you're going to do a uh, gonorrhea or chlamydia swab on a kid, right? Consider what you're going to do if that test comes back positive. So always think through the consequences of results before you do the test. And I'll leave you with the last, uh, the last slide, which is a very good quote, actually, which I, I always remember, which is that people can forget what you said, sometimes they don't. Uh, they can forget what you've done, sometimes they don't, but they will never... <laughs> But people will never forget how you made them feel. So when people with acute sexual health problems come in and see you, uh, no matter how bad a day you're having, try, try and help them walk through their journey, uh, even though you're having a, a difficult, busy day. Thanks. <laughs>